go ahead and hit record. Anyway, the, yes, it's been Remote Lab West has been working working well. Uh, we've been using the MATLAB and Simulink and HDL coder functions on Karapi, uh, and getting a lot of of good of good traction there for Neptune. All right, so th thank you, very appreciated. All right, uh, uh, let's go ahead and go to to Ken. Um, let us know how it's going. Oh, there we go. Had my headphone mute on. Um, let's see. I've uh, been looking at mapping the uh, parameters that we're interested in onto the uh, Theseus cores and uh, just tried to pull up their uh, compiler, code compiler, uh, just recently and ran into an issue, but it looks like Michelle and the, their team have worked to get that ironed out, I guess. We'll check that out after the the meeting. But uh, in general, the uh, I think we'll go with kind of some vanilla parameters to start with, and, and we can tweak as we go, it sounds like, um, using a, a 2x oversampled output on the... Uh, on the filter output that that'll avoid any uh, aliasing issues and will give us kind of a complex IQ, uh, you know, 2x oversampled uh, out output. So it, it that's kind of something that I think most uh, receiver designs are familiar in terms of being able to work with with that so that that seems like the most straightforward way that we should go there's there's different options that you can um i guess you can cut down on the size of the implementation but it introduces um some folding issues and you have to kind of shape shape things to deal with that um so i'm going to st stick with the uh 2x oversampled output for starters. That's all I've got. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, we've uh, we've made good use of the paper uh, that uh, that we were able to surface with a with a couple of people's sharp eyes uh, on the internet that removed the um, the redaction uh, that's uh, in um, in in most of the the PDFs. So thank you to um, Rick Hambly who found it on ResearchGate. Uh, and the paper in question is about is, is the the particular paper that the Theseus course folks use to implement. So that's what we've been been uh, learning, and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, so all that effort spent with the textbooks and uh, working through Fred Harris's examples, uh, which are also in our our repo, uh, paid off. So the we were hoping to use, uh, so what Ken's talking about is that there's a code generator function. It's a Python script that's in the Theseus course repository. Um, and he was hoping to use that to generate some of the code and we ran into an error. So I'd like to, if if Matthew is is willing to talk briefly about it, to, to go ahead and, and let us know about his uh, success in figuring out how to, how to navigate through the error that we saw. So floor is yours. Sure. Um so I went and reviewed um, the Theseus cores uh, repository in GitHub and found a, um, a, a code generator tool and was cloned the repository and ran the tool and got pretty much the same error. The error on the web app, um, you know, it, kind of, it said, in, in fact, in the text that the error was suppressed for some sort of security reason. <laughs> so when I ran it on my local machine, um, yeah, I gave a more clear error what it was. And the, the root cause was a data type error. So it was trying to use the NumPy uh, um, numeric package for Python and the data type it was using was trying to use an np.float or a float data type. That data type's been deprecated in the years since the tool was written. Uh, so the latest NumPy versions don't have it. So um, it, so that was affected not just the float type, but um, they were using uh, int type as well. Um, and so there were a few types um, that were causing a problem. I 
uh, just picked a relevant or what seemed like a matching type for the current Numpy package. And that uh, got through all those. And then there was a couple issues with the plotting um, and uh, one of the uh, square root functions. Um, and so I just kind of tweaked those as well and got it to the point where it would generate the uh, coefficients and the plots. And so um, it seems to be working now, more or less. Um, so I was going to uh, commit my changes and uh, push them back to the uh, GitHub repo uh, for everybody to access. Um, in terms of, you know, the int types were fairly straightforward because I just went to an int32, which I think is pretty standard. The float type is actually used in a function that's not used. So I, I just made it np double, and um, but it's not being used in the core in the in the code generator at all. So I don't think that it has any effect. Um, so there there could be some additional cleanup, but at least we I think it has something that's functional. It generates the plots and generates the the coefficients. Um, it, you know, assuming correctly, I haven't, you know, done any analysis to make sure that, you know, that they make sense, but there's the tool's not given any errors and the changes I made were, I think, fairly straightforward. Thank you very much. Uh, and and also I, I went ahead and added you to the to the uh, fork that we have of Theseus cores. Um, so you should have permissions to to go ahead and and submit the changes. Um, so apologies for that. It was my misunderstanding. I thought that adding people to the to our project uh, with all the repositories would do that. But the the forks that we have, and we have several forks of of interesting databases that needed to be handled. Uh, separately, so it should work. But just uh, let me know, um, and then we'll we'll get that updated, and then we'll we'll go ahead and test it. And I I'm very confident that the Theseus course folks will be will be interested in a in in this improvement. Um, it'll it'll help other people as well. So that they oh good can... yeah thank you that's that's uh that's what it's supposed to supposed to work. So yeah we'll we'll uh, we'll work on that uh, today and see what we can do when we. We need, we generate the ones for our for our parameters. Uh, so what we're looking at is a 10 megahertz wide subband. So that's the satellite uh, uplink downlink subbands. They're they're five they're 10 gigahertz, sorry 10 megahertz wide uh, on on five uh, is the uplink and 10 gigahertz is the downlink. So so what we're we're looking at for this particular uh, implementation is in the five gigahertz satellite uplink um, band. Our allocation that that 10 megahertz that we're using uh, divided up into 64 channels and then we're we're we want uh, two samples per symbol so we're doing the the 2x uh, option in in Theseus cores to get that and that we're also uh, using like kind of a guard band approach so not the overlapping um, spectrum analysis uh, version that's in the paper, but the communication channel thing. So so it's 0.8, uh, you know, so you'll see that if you look at the the paper. Uh, so we'll, we'll go ahead and proceed with that. I said that 16 taps per channel was probably a good place to start. I think that will work, especially with the, you know, with it being spread out a bit, that that should be a good, a good place to start. And I I don't think there were any parameters that we were confused about. Everything else uh, made sense. So w with any luck, uh, over the next week, it'll all be on Slack. We'll we'll post everything. Um, but we may have some, some code to work with to set up a receiver. Um, on the transmitter side, we do have GNU Radio working with, with Opulent Voice so to make multiple channels. We do have a, a flow graph that does that. So we, we do have actually some some things that work over the air. Uh, that's that's super ambitious to to start thinking about that, but but we have the things set up um, in the lab to to be able to test it. So generating the code uh, with this roadblock kind of out of the way, thanks to your um, your observations and expertise, uh, that, that puts us a lot a lot further forward. So that'll be a nice thing on the up uplink. That's the part of the project that has I think the least amount of development is the the uplink receiver. So that's that's why 
Ken's on board and, and working on it. All right, Matthew, anything else that, that we can uh, do for you or, or, or anything no, else you want to talk about? No, not right now. I'm still kind of mostly a lurker and observer, but. Um, like oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> you're definitely part of the team. We appreciate you very much. All right. And Anshul, it's so good to see you in person. Thank you so much. Uh, we have plenty to talk to you about. Uh, about a, There's a, a couple of teams that uh, would like to work with us, and I think you might be uniquely qualified to to handle that. Uh, so I'll, I'll bring that up uh, later. Uh, but in terms of FPGA work, uh, you have the floor. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So before going to FPGA, uh, another project with Pierre. Uh, how do you pronounce it? P-I-E-R-R-E. -E. His name, Pierre? P-I-E-R-R-O? R-R-E, I think. Oh, Pierre. Pierre. Pierre yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, for, for the, the lead of Ribbit? Yes. Yes, P Pierre. So, yeah, uh, had a detailed conversation with him on Sunday um, about how we can take this project forward. Uh, so there was discussion about setting up, uh, we will initially set up a Git repo, a website, and then how to involve what automobile industry into it, how we can go about developing a spec. So yeah, all those discussions, uh, we have a plan of action written down. Uh, so yeah, that's on that front. Uh, with uh, with the uh, uh, what's his name, Art and Bob, regarding uh, that Versatune project. So uh, I'm making I'm making progress on doing over the air update for their platform. So I'm progressing on that. Otherwise, the product is complete. Um, this is one of the main features that I propose and. Bob and Art are basically working on bug fixing. Now coming to transponder FPGA work, I have been out of touch for quite a while. So I right now this week I just bought my got Vivado to work and sort out some license issues. I have also changed my laptop, so I have to port the code of TVBS to got to a stage where I left and then start working on the transponder side. Uh, so yeah, that's what I've been doing. So far, uh, no blockers. Things are good, yeah. Right on. Yeah, so yeah, uh, uh, so that all, it's all amazing and, and thank you. Um, and the we still have the problem with the yeah. tools framework uh, so some progress has been made and I've had yet another round of conversations with, with MathWorks about it. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. seem to be the most, uh, accessible and amenable mm -hmm. and, and, um, you know, have listened and the MathWorks has, uh, has indicated that there might be another customer that's, that's encountering the same sort of API mismatch problems that we are, and they mm -hmm. want to use mm -hmm. updated tools and updated mm -hmm. frameworks and relatively new pedal Linux all of the other major companies, it's um, a much older version, like they're freezing their versions and not advancing mm -hmm. forward to these, mm -hmm. um, you know, newer, uh, either MATLAB or analog devices, HDL reference design. Mm -hmm. So so there's a lot of interest in somebody figuring this out. Um, and if we can, if we can do it uh, and then document it, then we'll be very, appreciated and popular mm -hmm. uh, but we still have the same problem uh, that we had over the past couple of months um, so that's that's going to be the the big big focus at least for me is after all of this other work with FCC comments and and mm -hmm. uh, other presentations and other projects uh, so we'll, we'll we'll you and I will probably be talking about that quite a bit so yeah. that's that's the status uh, and then in terms of new content uh you know there's some there's some good stuff in the in the repos so mm -hmm. so yeah great great to see you and and you. uh plenty plenty to work on in in slack uh, i do have a contact for versatune so i did meet somebody that has uh java experience yeah. that mm -hmm. also has communications you know that knows about comms like they mm -hmm. they understand about 
about mm -hmm. uh, digital communications. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and reach out to them on behalf of Versatune to see if they would like to take a look at the at the challenges, uh, the Java challenges that the Versatune team has has had. So, yeah. I think yeah. on that point, uh, I, I did I did see your message you posted on Versatune receiver, but as I mentioned that the the product the job the project is almost done. So yeah, sure at this moment, but yeah, of course there's no harm in reaching out. Yeah, no, I think it'd be good to have somebody check over it and clean up whatever final yeah. issues remain. Yes, yes. Uh, and so yeah, I'm very proud of Versatune. I think that's that's going to be well received. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. All right. So on. On my behalf, we we had house guests here over the past week, so that that was really super fun and awesome. Uh, and but it did cut into my time. However, I did make some progress on on Neptune, um, and I the cyclic prefix uh, is a is a neat technique. This is found in all sorts of digital communications projects. Uh, cyclic prefix is a prefix or a postfix or a preamble or some sort of chunk of the of the signal, some sort of chunk of the data that you're trying to send. The basic idea here is you have a bunch of blah, blah, blah that you're sending out over the air. And you, you come to the conclusion that, well, how do I know where I start my frame? You know, most of mm -hmm. what we do is set into frames, you know, like train cars going down a train track. Well, how do you tell, how does the receiver tell what the start of the frame is? A very common way of doing this is some sort of known chunk of data that you that you put in there. That's the way DVB S2 does it, you know, so there's a starter frame that's a particular uh, chunk of data and you just look for it. So you set up a correlator that sifts through and it goes, aha, you know, this particular phrase, this passphrase uh, is what I'm seeing. And it sends up a signal. You know, it says, "Ah, very, very confident that what I've just seen is the is the preamble or prefix or startup frame." For most of the OFDM uh, app applications or implementations, especially like like LTE or Wi-Fi or whatever, what they do is is not a fixed uh, prefix or fixed startup frame. You know, you could do fixed, or you can do this neat little trick. You take the last X number of, of samples. So you have your train car of data and you take the last, or I don't know. On, just, <laughs> so I'm reading start to end. Okay, there we go. Okay, so you take the last X number of samples and you copy it. And then you put it on the front. And you're like, oh, that's interesting. So you, so you grow your frame a little bit. You have this sorry, chunk of data from the end, and you put it on the front. Now, the neat thing about it is you know how long the frame is. So what you do is you just compare and you're just watching for things to match and they'll match for X number of samples. So this is essentially a correlator. You know, it's like having a known, you know, preamble or start a frame symbol, except it's different for every frame because the last 82 in, the, in our case, for the 20 megahertz version of Neptune, the last 82 samples uh, put in the front, that's all the same. And so you just look for a match and when they stop matching, that's when the new data starts and you throw away the stuff that that matched. Okay, and so getting that working in Simulink was a, a, a little bit of an adventure because of the, to me, odd way that Simulink handles um, sample rates. So to me, uh, sample rates, you know, your sample rate, the rate that you sample things, that's kind of a physical reality. That's the heart of the whole thing. And just like in GNU radio, sample rates, not really sample rate. It's all bookkeeping and you just have to sell out and adopt with an open heart and throw away all of your <laughs> physics mindset and, and just embrace the chaos of whatever it is in in math land that's going on and once we did that it all became very clear and so we now have an hdl compatible uh simulink transmitter all the way up to where the cyclic prefix is added and i think the last thing is something that we talked about on the slack channel the last thing is the pulse shaping filter any sort of transmit filter and then it gets chucked out the door and this is all still in simulink so it'll be I'll probably mess it up with some sort of channel uh, noise from the channel. 
and then attempt to write a receiver in, in Simulink to double check to make sure that we know what we're doing and then try to set that up as test benches. So the, the main core device under test is an, its own sub-assembly. The rest of it is designated as uh, essentially test benches in VHDL and then convert it to HCL and then try to test that. Um, and then we'll we'll be able to move it to one of our dev board stations. So so this will I'll do it as 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 well as I can. I'm still trying to find additional people to like. Hey, if you like doing this, if you want to take this on, here it is, and it's super fun and lets you get some some really cool skills that are very transferable because OFDM is uh, popular. So that's my my end of the uh, of the report. Um, all of that's going going pretty well. Um, so just a, just a question of like perspective, understanding what the tool is giving you. There's some really neat things in Simulink. Uh, I, I'm kind of a hardcore MATLAB person. So this whole experience has been um, a pretty steep learning cor curve for me to try to embrace Simulink or to, to get into it. Uh, it's paid off. So the, the, one of the nice things is that it does keep track of the timing domains for you. This is all still in a simulated environment. So it's not like timing domains or uh, clock domains like you would if you were working directly with the chip yet. Uh, that's still in the future. Uh, but it does keep track of it. And and that was what kind of flagged the um, the source of the confusion and that, that we had been approaching it a little bit off was that it lights up the different parts of the design with the different timing. Uh, so that was that was pretty cool. It's nice to it's nice when the tool actually helps you. <laughs> it is. All right, and that's it. Um, that's all that's all I got. Uh, as usual, the the roadblocks are pretty much uh, so, you know they're my fault and uh, you know because because you know, Stuff's hard to do, uh, and the the resources. My the one that I would really like would be more time to <laughs> to do this this stuff, um, and we should have have more done, um, you know, by next week. I'll, I'll meet up with Leonard, the the lead of Neptune, uh, tomorrow morning for our usual uh, weekly check in, and I expect to hear uh, some about some more progress with the Python side. Uh, you can see in the Neptune repository that there's also a Python model from Andreas who authored the spec. And uh, Leonard's been doing a lot of work to to rearrange and to to update and upgrade. Uh, Paul, who's on the call, has a pull request in or filed an issue uh, about the self-tests not working as intended. And, and a, at least some potential fixes have been offered through that issue or the filed issue. So we should be able to improve the Python tests by quite a bit uh, if all the tests work. Uh, that's that's always a good thing. All right, any other comments or questions before we close for the, for the week? All right, thank you all. We couldn't do it without you. Um, we have, there's lots of stuff going on and uh, it's a delight to, to work with such wonderful folks. Very, mu very much appreciated. All right, see you on Slack.